Hi folks, uh, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you. I want to just share um, some thoughts about a book called N.T. Wright's The Resurrection of the Son of God. Um, I've got a paper here, uh, which is an overview of the book, uh, and it's by Steve Walton, called Easter in Durham, N.T. Wright's uh, The Resurrection of the Son of God. So if you just want to, if you can't afford the book, uh, read this article, because this will help you. When I was at seminary, we did a full uh, semester on N.T. Wright. Uh, we had to look at some of his major writings. Uh, and since I was at seminary, one, a couple of uh, N.T. Wright major works have come out since then. Uh, one is The Resurrection of the Son of God. Um, and recently, Wright's written a lot of volumes on uh, Paul's uh, epistles and life. Uh, as you all know, I'm not a great fan of N.T. Wright when it comes to the being sound evangelical. But at the same time, you have to give him respect as a scholar uh, because he, he has done uh, uh, quite a magnificent job in terms of uh, researching the topics that he does. Uh, the problem is, is his, I think, is his hermeneutical method tends to affect orthodoxy of Christianity in its purest form. That's what I think. Um, it's not as uh, objective historical context objective as he makes it out to be but you would only know that if you had a good grasp of the history of uh, theology and biblical theology in western culture you wouldn't know that uh, even pastors wouldn't really know that unless you had a, a good grasp especially of 19th century uh, biblical theology uh, so take my word for it okay Anyhow, having said that, he's a, he is a, a great scholar and deserves respect for the work that he has done. And uh, I just want to share from this uh, article uh, some thoughts about the book, uh, The Resurrection of the Son of God. You can actually get uh, a PDF of some of the book. Uh, if you type in NT Writes The Resurrection of the Son of God, you should be able to find at least a couple of chapters free around the internet. <coughs> so, Steve Walton says, This, I repeat, says Walton, is a major contribution both to any New Testament scholarship and to the church's understanding of the resurrection of Jesus and its implications for the believing community and deserves wide study. I rather fear it will not receive that because of its length. About 80 of the 817 pages are given up with abbreviations, bibliography and indices, and, indices, and that would be a pity for right rights accessibly, engagingly, wittingly and beautifully, both in the book's overall organisation and in its choice, phrasing an excellent illustration and metaphors. So this is the shape of the argument of the book. Wright's overall argument has five parts. In chapters one and four, pages one to 206, after a key mythological discussion, he sets the scene of how death and resurrection were understood in the ancient world. Wright sets to debunk, notably, these scholarly myths. Number one, the Jewish setting of the resurrection was fuzzy. Number two, Paul believed in the spiritual res resurrection. And three, the early Christians believed that Jesus had been exalted to heaven and be, they used resurrection language to speak of this. Number four, the gospel resurrection stories and learning. Number five, the appearance of Jesus was subjective to religious experiences. So that is what um, N.T. writes counteracting in his book. And so the first chapter includes his very important definition of resurrection, italics. There is no difference between pagans, Jews, and Christians. They all understood the Greek word anatasis and its cognates and other related terms we shall meet to mean new life after a period of being dead. Pagans denied this possibility. Some Jews affirmed it as a long-term future hope. Virtually all Christians claimed that it had happened to Jesus and would happen to them in the future. All of them were speaking of a new life after life after death in the popular sense of fresh living in Parliament following period during which one might not live in some other non-bodily fashion. 
Nobody except the Christians in respect to Jesus thought that this had already happened, even in isolated cases. Following on are three key chapters in which Wright represents the evidence for the pagan Old Testament post-biblical Jewish sources for this claim. So in part two, in chapter five, nine, eight, focus turns to Paul, our early witness to Jesus. Wright first works carefully through Pauline letters, including one or two Corinthians, in what he understands to be chronological order, discussing key passages. He then turns his focus onto onto the Corinthian letters and discuss the overall shape of the argument of the letters, while setting aside the most important. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and 5, 10. For a separate chapter, chapter 7, and then e, chapter 8 turns to Paul's Damascus world experience, as recounted in his letters and acts, to consider what Paul says happened to him here. Action is wise working from the less controversial text to the most controversial, so the overall shape of Paul's resurrection beliefs become clear before attempting to expand 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5 which have been the text to which many have turned first to argue for a spiritual view of resurrection. Part 3 in chapters 9 and 12, page 399 to 583, looks wider in the early Christian writings, although setting the gospel resurrection narratives aside for later study, surveying the rest of the New Testament in chapter 9 and 10. The fathers through to the early 3rd century, early Syriac, Syriac Christianity, and the Nag Hammadi writings in chapter 11, the argument of the parties drawn together in a splendid discussion of the status of Jesus the Messiah and Lord as a result of the resurrection in chapter 12. In chapter 4, in part 4, chapter 13, pages 583 to 682, finally turns the resurrection narratives in the Gospels right as deliberately left these to the end since they have special, special issues associated with them. After a good general survey of issues in the resurrection narratives, chapter 13, he studies each of the canonical gospels in turn, chapter 14 and 17, offering many helpful insights and clarifications, as well as advancing his overall argument that the early Christians believed Jesus to have been raised bodily from the dead. And finally, part five in chapters 18 and 19, pages 683 to 738, turns to the question of what actually happened at Easter, having established what the early Christians believed to have happened. Here, Wright presents a clear and cogent argument for the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus as the only plausible explanation of the historical evidence. Chapter 18, and he then goes on to explore what this might mean for Jesus' status as far as the early Christians was concerned as son of God in chapter 19. Um, so then, I'll just read a couple of bits that, that I think were helpful. Methodologically, right defines history carefully since it is frequently defined in scholarship to exclude the very possibility of resurrection. Yeah. Using a fivefold analysis of history as an event, significant event, provable event, writing about past events and what modern historians can say about the past. He robustly critiques the views that we either cannot or should not study the resurrection historically and goes on to consider how to study the topic. His approach is to map early Christian beliefs within the wider world of Second Temple Judaism after mapping this Judaism within the world of pagan beliefs in the Grecian Roman world of the period. To this point, he carefully defines resurrection, quotation above, so that we are clear what we are discussing. I think it's important to remember that when we're studying the resurrection and any claim to a miracle, that we do come to the study of the past with our bias. And if you believe that there could never be a miracle because of the uniformity of nature, well, number one, you don't understand quantum mechanics. And number two, um, if you're studying a historical claim of a miracle of the past, then you have to deal with it on historical grounds. And that means you have to be objective and you can't rule out or rule in whether this is the supernatural happened and you need to be more open about historical claims of miracles. He goes on the discussion, discussion of the ancient 
pagan sources in chapter three is fascinating. Right. Tracking the questions people ask, the practices they embrace, the symbols they use, and the stories they tell. Readers of earlier books will recognize these as right worldview questions. For many readers, this material will be too detailed in the way they want to turn to the convenient summary in page 81 to 4, which highlights that while there was a variety of views, no one in ancient paganism expected or believed in a re embodiment, since for most, under the influence of Plato, the body was an encumbrance for which to escape. This applied in, pick in particular to those who would div divinize, such as emperors. Thus, the early Christian claim of Jesus' resurrection would have been regarded as impossible, since the ancients knew that the dead people do not rise, and this hardly a modern scientific discovery, as we might believe from some New Testament scholarship. Um, if we go on, um, I'll just read a little bit about... Um, so what about the Gospels? Finally, we come to the Gospel resurrection narratives. The sensible discussion of where the evangelist found the story is right argues that it's hard to establish any dependence between those found in the four canonical Gospels. And further, it right, rightly criticizes his cross and view that an early edition of the Gospel of Peter was the source of much of the canonical material, offering eight cogent points of critique to Cross in page 594. He's also pessimistic about form redaction criticism, offering much help on the ground that there is no sign of the issue and situation of the church of the 40s and 60s in the origins of these stories. There are, writes observes, interestingly, some rather surprising features of the resurrection narratives. They lack much reference to Old Testament scripture, by contrast with the remainder of the Gospels, they lack the implication of the resurrection of Jesus, guaranteeing future personal hope of a life after death for believers. Rather, they commission believers to this worldly activity and mission. They present a rather unusual, to say, the least body of Jesus, which can enter locked rooms, hide its identity at times, and yet also eat with the disciples as they focus on women as primary witness whose testimony would not stand up in the first century court. These features lead right to conclude that no one inventing these stories would have invented them like this, so strange and lacking in smooth, smoothing and consistency. This right regards the gospel narratives as early, originated well before Paul, and argues that they tell a basically consistent story amidst multiple surface inconsistencies. Page 614. So, this book is a really good book. It's a thoroughly researched book. Um, N.T. Wright's good at collecting all the ancient sources. That's what I, what's the good thing about N.T. Wright. And he packages it in a way that you can analyze it in a really good objective way. Um, so I would encourage you to get hold of the book. I would encourage you to read the book. And uh, those who are skeptical, uh, this is the kind of the material that you need to be reading if you want to really engage with Christianity and understand where Christianity is coming from. Uh, okay, I'll leave you with that. And thank you for listening. Take care.